I'm Harold Attridge, Dean of the Divinity School and uh, this year's Chair of the Terry Lecture Committee. The Terry Lectures, as you probably know, were established in 1905 by a gift from Dwight Harrington Terry of Bridgeport, Connecticut to support a series of lectures on religion and its application to human welfare in the light of scientific knowledge and philosophical insight. Terry lectures have included distinguished representatives of various disciplines, philosophers, psychologists, anthropologists, evolutionary theorists, and theologians all have participated in this distinguished series. As many of you certainly know, this is the second event of the season sponsored by the Terry Lectureship. A month ago, we gathered at the Whitney Humanities Center to celebrate 100 years of Terry Lectures with a symposium on the question of why the debate between science and religion continues. We heard a fascinating conversation about that subject, which included the perspective of scientists, a historian, a sociologist, and a philosopher. We also celebrated 100 years of the uh, lectureship with a dinner in what has been called the Sistine Chapel of Evolution, the Hall of Dinosaurs at the Peabody Museum. For this year's lecture, we gather in another significant space, Lindsley Chittenden Hall, with its lovely Tiffany windows, which gloriously celebrate the harmony between art, science, and religion. The Terry Lectures, coming from much the same period as Tiffany's glass, express a similar hope for a fruitful harmony between the disciplines that frame our academic world. Some of that harmony comes from the fellowship of conversation that these lectures stimulate. And to facilitate that conversation, there will be a reception after the lecture in the hall outside of this auditorium. Please join us for that and for the subsequent lectures in this series, which will be held on Thursday of this week and Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Now to introduce this year's Terry Lecturer, I'll call on my colleague, Dale Martin of the Department of Religious Studies. Dale. I remember distinctly my first introduction to Barbara Hernstein Smith. It was unfortunately not in person, um, but through a famous article she had recently published in Critical Inquiry in around 1983. The article was titled Consequences of Va um, Contingencies of Value, which later became a full uh, book length treatment of that topic. This was in the middle of the 1980s. I was a doctoral student in religious studies here at Yale. Though I was working mainly on New Testament studies and concentrating on the social history of early Christianity in the Greco-Roman world, but I was also caught up in the exciting, heady days when Yale was a hotbed of theory. We graduate students felt like we were playing hooky as we drank up Derrida, Foucault, Irigaré, Mikhail Bakhtin, Fred Jameson, Stanley Fish, you know, the list goes on and on. It was really growing all the time. In my case, I felt as if I had to read all of this stuff with a flashlight under the sheets because in my department at that time, it was a little relatively conservative from a theoretical point of view. It what was, though, the heyday of theory. I was at Yale, and I was not about to let that bus get away without getting on it, at least as an amateur. So that was when I, probably following the lead of some of my fellow students who actually took courses in the English department, I read Professor Smith's article, Contingencies of Value. It blew me away. The basic argument wasn't such a surprise. She was entering into the debate of those days about literary canon. What makes a great piece of literature? What makes it great? How is aesthetic value created? And she was arguing a position that was controversial then, even if it has, in the meantime, become less controversial that aesthetic value is not something that simply resides in the work of art as an intrinsic property, but is created by a complex social and historical process. The basic point did not take me by surprise. What so impressed me was the force of the argument. I read and reread the article because it was one of the clearest, most incisive, most compelling arguments I had ever read. There was not one wasted word, not one superfluous comma. There were no holes. Everything was there, and there was th nothing there that didn't need to be there. I remember after reading the article more than once, saying to myself as a green graduate student, if I could write one piece of scholarship in my life that was as good, as tight, as perfect, 
I'd die happy. I'm still working on it, so don't expect me to keel over. Professor Smith began her academic career actually in the sciences in biology and experimental psychology and philosophy at City College in New York. She moved over, though, without ever losing her interest in the sciences, into literary criticism, earning her PhD in English and American literature at Brandeis University. She taught literature and literary theory at Bennington College and the University of Pennsylvania before moving in 1987 to Duke University. She is currently Braxton Craven Professor of Literature and English at Duke and also Distinguished Professor of English at Brown University. Professor Smith's early interests in Renaissance poetry soon migrated into more explicitly philosophical and theoretical interests in literature and language more generally, including, as I've already noted, interests in the social matrices and factors constructing literature and canon themselves. This led to more explicit publications addressing issues of epistemology. How do we know what we think we know? What is knowledge? Is it something essentially different from belief? And if we can only with difficulty make such distinctions in the humanities, what about the sciences? Is a piece of scientific knowledge different in kind from a humanistic belief or interpretation? To pursue these questions, Professor Smith founded the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Science at Duke, of which she is the director. Professor Smith's interest in science studies led to the publication in 1997 of her book, Belief and Resistance, Dynamics of Contemporary Intellectual Controversy, in which she dove right into the debates between two ways of thinking about the status of scientific knowledge. The two convenient labels applied to the two main positions, complete with inadequate caricature on both sides, we can be sure, are realism and constructivism. Professor Smith's book does a great job of bringing appropriate nuance and complexity to arguments that have too often been conducted by means of exaggeration, straw men, name calling, and outright misrepresentation. Professor Smith's most recent book, published in 2005, is titled Scandalous Knowledge, Science, Truth, and the Human. It constitutes several needed answers to those who would attempt to stop the debate entirely simply by waving red flags such as relativism or by ridiculing the constructivist position without apparently understanding it with any sophistication. What holds together Professor, Professor Smith's various interventions in these debates about literature, value, and truth is her, later, is her laser focus on language itself. She is constantly analyzing rhetoric and insisting that the real meaning of scientific statements cannot be separated from rhetoric itself. She has also constantly insisted that we realize that we can never escape interpretation. We never have reality all by itself. We have interpretations. And that need not result in despair or willy-nilly relativism or the collapse of literary value or scientific truth. Knowing of these interests and accomplishments, I asked Professor Smith if she would please turn her attentions to religion and religious belief. How are, these kinds, how are those kinds of beliefs and behaviors like or unlike scientific beliefs? I'm happy to say that she has spent the past two years deeply considering these questions, and her lectures this and next week are the much anticipated result. I guarantee you, we are in for a ride. Please welcome Professor Barbara Hernstein Smith, whose first lecture is The New Naturalism, Cognitive Machinery. Professor Smith. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be at Yale. It's an honor to be part of the Terry tradition. And my thanks particularly to the Terry Committee uh, for offering me and to Dale Martin for persuading me to accept the chance to pursue what has been for me a wonderful intellectual adventure. I'd like to begin today by giving a brief preview of the entire series so you'll have some idea if not yet of its outcome, then at least of its major themes, characters, and events. My major focus in these lectures will be recent efforts primarily by anthropologists and psychologists to explain various features of religion on the basis of current findings in the natural sciences. 
notably evolutionary biology and the rather sprawling new field of cognitive science. It's this general project that I'll be referring to here as the new naturalism. Examples of such efforts, and I'll be looking at these, include Pascal Boyer's, I call him Boyer, he allows himself to be called Boyer, he's French and it could be Boyer, B-O-Y-E-R, Pascal Boyer's Religion Explained, the Evolutionary Origins of Religious Thought, Scott Atron's In Gods We Trust, the Evolutionary Landscape of Religion, and synthesizing and promoting these, Daniel Dennett's Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. Also of interest here will be a book by the German classicist Walter Burkert titled Creation of the Sacred, Tracks of Biology in Early Religion. That will be representing a rather different tradition in the naturalistic study of religion. A second project that I'll be looking at, which could be seen as the inverse of the first, is what I'll be calling the new natural theology. This is the attempt by a number of scientifically knowledgeable theologians and some theologically inclined scientists to negotiate between the accounts of the world developed in the natural sciences and their own religious convictions. Examples here include John Polkinghorne's Exploring Reality, The Intertwining of Science and Religion, and a work by John Hort that I'll be discussing in the third lecture. That's titled, Deeper Than Darwin, The Prospect for Religion in the Age of Evolution. Both Hort and Polkinghorne endorse without reservation current physical and biological accounts of natural phenomena, while at the same time seeking to use a phrase they share to find room in those accounts for more or less traditional Christian belief. The two projects just mentioned, which involve respectively the naturalizing of religion and the theologizing of nature, represent signally divergent cognitive styles and certainly today mutually suspicious, not to say antagonistic, intellectual communities. Nevertheless, when examined in conjunction, they can, I think, illuminate both each other and also some more general features of human cognition and contemporary intellectual life. The possibility of such mutual and general illuminations makes an exploration of these two projects a fitting problem, um, a, sorry, a fitting undertaking, I think, for the Terry Lectures. For a central and increasingly difficult problem for all of us, seen in somewhat different terms by the founder of these lectures, is how to understand radically divergent cognitive commitments and what could be seen as intractably different cognitive tastes. That problem, itself jointly conceptual and pragmatic, intellectual and ethical, will be on the horizon throughout these lectures and the specific focus of the last one. A few preliminary remarks on the intellectual contexts of these various themes and something of my own intellectual perspective on them. Over the past half century or so, traditional accounts and conceptions of knowledge and science, largely rationalist, realist, and positivist, have been significantly challenged by work in the history, sociology, and philosophy of science, and by the related emergence of an increasingly well-articulated well accounts and conceptions, largely constructivist and pragmatist. These developments have significant implications for familiar contrasts drawn between science and its classic oppositional others. For example, art, ideology, the humanities, myth, magic, and of course, religion. Spelling out these implications does not amount to flattening out important differences. Science is not to be equated with myth or scientific knowledge reduced to ideology. But with regard to science and religion, as to any other of these oppositions, it does involve noting resemblance, interaction, continuity, and sometimes duplication, where only difference, disjunction, and contrast have previously been seen. And in registering differences, 
It involves attempting to characterize them in subtler, more attentive, and more accurate ways. For example, knowledge may be understood not as in some familiar formulations in contrast to mere belief, but as beliefs that have become especially well established either in communal or individual experience. So understood are knowledge or established beliefs can be seen as emerging continuously from three interacting sources. Our individual perceptual behavioral activities and experiences, more general human cognitive processes, and particular collective systems of thought and practice. Accordingly, such familiar oppositions as beliefs duly compelled by reason and evidence versus beliefs improperly influenced by emotions or interests would give way to the idea that all human beliefs are contingently shaped and multiply constrained. Similarly, such familiar distinctions as that between objectively validated scientific knowledge and mere personal opinions would be replaced by the idea that all articulated beliefs are a more or less congruent with other relatively stable and well-established beliefs, b more or less effective with regard to solving current problems or furthering ongoing projects, and c more or less appropriable by other people and extendable to other domains. The differences expressed by the classic contrasts, and there certainly are differences, and they certainly are important, are not denied. But rather than being conceived as polar opposites on a single scale, they would be reconceived as gradient differences with regard to multiple relevant dimensions. In other words, a matter of more or less in a variety of ways, conceptual congruence, pragmatic effectiveness, extendability, and so forth, rather than as mutually antagonistic contrastive possibilities in a single way, for example, truth, validity, or rationality. Attributes which, at their least problematic, can be seen as stand-ins for high scores on some array of just such dimensions. It's clear, I think, that a view of knowledge and belief along the lines just traced would affect standard ways of framing the epistemic relation between science and religion, both taken for the moment as monolithic enterprises, something that I'll question later on. For example, the arrays of knowledge or beliefs in question, that is scientific accounts and religious doctrines, would be seen as continuously interacting rather than as in Stephen Jay Gould's notion of non-overlapping magisteria as fundamentally distinct and disjunct. There are, to be sure, psychological and political advantages to the latter view, which avoids sharp cognitive collisions and at least some conflicts in the public arena. But the alternative conception con suggested here which alerts us to various forms of continuity and interactivity between scientific knowledge and popular, including religious belief, has the distinct intellectual advantage of better accommodating the empirical, including historical, evidence. As my title indicates, <clears throat> My investigations here of both the new naturalist studies of religion and the new natural theology will involve particular views of human cognition, currently a controversial matter. I'm not sure when, the, when it wasn't. In these lectures, as elsewhere, I view cognitive processes in what's been called an ecological or dynamic framework. The term's not mine, but I think they're both good. That is, like others in fields ranging from the psychology of perception to the sociology of knowledge, I understand cognition as the full range of activities through which, as embodied creatures, we, like other organisms, interact with our 
more or less continuously changing physical and social environments, thereby ourselves changing more or less continuously. Accordingly, I don't identify cognitive processes with mental as distinct from bodily activities, nor do I see those processes located in some especially interior space, either the mind or the brain, as distinct from the total embodied organism. Nor do I conceive the relevant activities or processes, whether psychological, physiological, or neural, as computations, that is, as discrete rule-governed operations performed on items of presumptively objective autonomous information. Although I do see various cognitive tendencies as emerging more or less reliably in humans, I don't see them as necessarily innate in the sense of inevitably present at birth and or genetically specified. Nor finally, although I presume that the neural structures involved in the emergence of various cognitive tendencies have evolutionary histories, I do not see either of them, the structures or the tendencies, as fixed largely in the forms they had in the brains or behavior of our Stone Age ancestors living under Stone Age conditions. I'll invoke some elements of this ecological dynamic view of cognition as we go along. An important point to be registered just now, however, is that in a number of significant respects, it differs from the views that dominate the field of evolutionary psychology and that figure centrally in the new naturalist accounts of religion. I'll turn so shortly to an examination of those accounts, but a few observations first on the general issue of naturalism in the study of religion. There's no reason to doubt, though it has been doubted, that strictly naturalistic, or as it is variously said, materialistic or scientific accounts of religion can be developed. Such accounts dealing both with ancient and exotic forms, and also with traditions closer to home, have been offered by philosophers, historians, anthropologists, and other scholars and theorists since antiquity. The most significant of them make up an intellectually impressive roll call. Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, David Hume's Natural History of Religion, Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morals, Max Weber's Sociology of Religion, and Durkheim's Elementary Forms of the Religious Life. Intellectually impressive as these are, along with other more recent naturalistic accounts of religion, their adequacy can be questioned from a variety of angles. The phenomena that make up what is called in most of these works religion are exceptionally heterogeneous, ranging from individual experiences and popular beliefs to formal doctrines, ritual practices, social institutions, and political effects. Moreover, they include at least presumptively practices observed or reported from ancient times to the present in all types of cultures and societies and across all regions of the globe. Indeed, it's not clear that religion is a coherent set or domain of phenomena at all, or whether like culture, art, or literature, it is not a shifting artifact of the multiple disciplines and discourses that have taken it as their subject. The question inevitably haunts the field of religious studies and contributes, it seems, to an ongoing sense of crisis among its practitioners. But as with anthropology, art history, or literary studies in regard to their no less problematic subject domains, not to the point, at least not yet, of dissolving the discipline itself. In any case, in the study of religion, as in any effort to explain a vast and complex array of phenomena, different levels of analysis and theoretical perspectives can always be brought into play, and especially significantly here, different projects and purposes can also be invoked, each implying more or less radically different criteria of assessment. Accordingly, no explanation of religion, naturalistic or other, 
can properly claim to be complete, final, most fundamental, or most genuinely explanatory. But of course, that doesn't keep theorists from claiming just such status for their particular accounts. In addition to limits of the kind just described, common to intellectual projects of any scope, efforts to give naturalistic accounts of religion also encounter difficulties of another kind, these familiar from efforts to explain other highly valued human experiences or achievements, for example, consciousness, love, literature, or, interesting for our purposes, science itself, in strictly naturalistic terms. In these other cases, too, naturalistic, including social scientific accounts, for example, cost-benefit analyses of parental self-sacrifice, or catalogs of mammalian mating strategies in Jane Austen's novels, these are, of course, real examples, um, uh, are regarded by many people as manifestly inadequate to the experience or achievement in question, reductive, insensitive, and commonly as missing the main thing, whatever that thing is. For example, in the case of religion, the experience of the sacred. Views and sentiments along these lines with regard to the study of religion were given influential expression about 50 years ago by the scholar Mircea Eliada, and many other scholars in the field have concurred, at least to the extent of regarding religious studies as clearly a humanistic discipline, not a natural science, and for some, not even properly a social science. The question of appropriate methodology, however, is by no means settled and continues to generate disputes among practitioners. Thus, some scholars of religion appealing to 19th century founders and early achievements seek, as one of them puts it, quote, to recover the scientific agenda in the academic study of religion on which basis it achieved cognitive legitimation, end quote. Responding to such programs, philosopher of religion Paul Griffiths observes, quote, any attempt to make sense and use of an idea of religion that systematically rejects theological assumptions will fail, end quote. Citing the historical, etymological, and conceptual difficulties presented to such efforts by the very idea of religion, which is the name of Griffiths' article which appeared in the journal, First Things, uh, the very idea of religion which Griffiths maintains is, quote, is so deeply intertwined with something theologically and specifically Christian that attempts to disentangle it by abstraction will produce a cipher. He concludes that this is so shows that the scientific study of religion is without a future. Though Griffiths may be right about the conceptual intractability of the term religion, his prediction appears precipitous. Certainly for researchers working in fields such as anthropology, psychology, or sociology, and who regard religion more ecumenically understood as an object of ongoing or precisely scientific interest, such definitional concerns will seem scholastic and such predictions irrelevant. Indeed, the past 15 years or so have been a period of extraordinary activity in pursuit of just that precise and emphatic interest, that is, the study of religion scientifically, with the appearance of a number of self-consciously revolutionary and science-identified books with titles like Rethinking Religion, Connecting Cognition and Culture, or How Religion Works Toward a New Cognitive Science of Religion, or Why Gods Persist, a scientific approach to religion. Some idea of the revolutionary temper of these works can be gathered from the opening words of one of them, Rethinking Religion, co-authored by E. Thomas Lawson and Robert N. Macaulay. Quote, some books they write make trouble. It is certainly the aim of this one to do so, end quote. The particular trouble that Lawson and Macaulay seek to make is for the field of religious studies, which they represent as dominated and enfeebled by the, I'm quoting here, timidity and torpor 
of scholars who deny the possibility of fruitful scientific explanation of wide domains of human action and experience and whose ambitions extend no further than contorted taxonomies and thick descriptions. Thick descriptions is a jab at Clifford Geertz. Um, a certain amount of fractious self-positioning of this sort is a recurrent, though not universal, feature of these works. What unites them more essentially is, first, the centrality for their approaches of methods and theories drawing on evolutionary biology and cognitive science, especially as developed in the field of evolutionary psychology, and second, in a significant number of them, but again, not all, a strenuous identification of their projects with science, often quite monolithically and otherwise uncritically conceived. It is in these respects, that is, a preemptive orientation toward a particular type of psychobiological explanation of human behavior and an earnest and sometimes aggressive scientism that these works constitute what I am calling here the new naturalism in the study of religion. I would stress parenthetically that in my use of the term, my use of the term, scientism is not equivalent to empiricism or experimentalism, nor is it properly applied to the valuing of rigor and precision in the pursuit of knowledge, nor most significantly is it entailed by methodological naturalism per se. Rather, it refers to the idea, very dubious in my view, that I'll return to in the last lecture, that the aims, methods, and products of the natural sciences should be the model for all knowledge practices. Um, the point I would emphasize here is that naturalistic accounts of religion need not be scientistic in the sense just given, and as we see, not all of them are so. The New Naturalist Project requires, in my view, careful examination and discriminating assessment, both an appreciation of the intellectual interest of the project and its promise for a general understanding of important features of religion, but also critical attention to the intellectual confinements represented by some of its characteristic commitments, methodological, conceptual, and also, in effect, ideological. In examining these accounts of religion, my focus today will be on one of the most influential of them, a book by anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist Pascal Boyer, titled with imposing finality, Religion Explained. Boyer opens his book with a contrast that will structure the whole of it. Between, on the one hand, explanations of religion such as his own, based on, quote, findings and models in cognitive psychology, anthropology, linguistics, and evolutionary biology, end quote, and on the other, what he refers to as common intuitions, spontaneous common sense ideas, and most accounts of the origins of religion. While he gives few explicit citations of the latter, it's evident from his descriptions and incidental references, he alludes to, quote, bookshelves overflowing with treatises on religion, histories of religion, religious people's accounts of their ideas, and so on. Um, it's evident that uh, these include not only works by scholars such as Eliada or Griffiths, who see religion as, for one reason or another, immune to naturalistic explanation, but also the classic naturalistic accounts that I mentioned earlier by, among others, Hume, Weber, and Durkheim. Common and spontaneous are, of course, peculiar terms to use to describe theories that offer, as these do, extensive empirical observation, considerable erudition, detailed analyses, and more or less unconventional conclusions. For Boyer, however, the crucial contrast is between theories that are genuinely scientific, in a particular sense that I'll discuss in a moment, and everything else. Accordingly, all the items on those overflowing bookshelves are equivalent to each other and to anyone's spontaneous ideas about religion. Quote, all, he declares, fail to tell us why we have religion and why it is the way it is, end quote. 
In illustrating this contrast, Boyer produces a typology of failed non or pre-scientific explanations of religion, and for each a proper scientific alternative. Thus, against the view that religions offer people ways to understand significant but puzzling phenomena, he calls this the intellectualist account, he informs reader, readers, quote, our minds are not general explanation machines, rather minds consist of many different specialized explanatory engines, more properly called inference systems, each of which is adapted to particular kinds of events and automatically suggests explanations for these events, end quote. Similarly, against the view that religions allay common human anxieties, which he calls the emotivist account, he writes, quote, but human emotions are not that simple. They happen because the mind is a bundle of complicated systems solving particular complex problems through computational programs that evolved to be triggered by certain situations, end quote. After brief discussions of what he identifies as two other common and incorrect explanations of religion, namely the social fun functionalist account, according to which religions hold society together and support morality, and the irrationalist account, which attributes religious concepts to undeveloped or distorted ways of thinking, Boyer provides a summary of the correct explanation. Some concepts happen to connect with inference systems in the brain in a way that makes recall and communication very easy. Some concepts happen to connect to our social mind. Some of them are represented in such a way that they soon become plausible and direct behavior. The ones that do all this are the religious ones we actually observe in human societies." End quote. Boyer's main point in the passages just quoted and throughout the book is that contrary to most attempted explanations, religious ideas and practices originate not as recurrent, socially established, culturally transmitted, and more or less functional or dysfunctional human responses to recurrent human experiences, but rather as the combined effect of a number of highly specialized mental mechanisms. In the evolutionary psychology paradigm to which Boyer subscribes, it's presumed that these mechanisms provided our Stone Age ancestors with adaptively advantageous solutions to an array of specific fitness-related problems posited as recurrent under Stone Age conditions. For example, foraging, avoiding predators, choosing mates, or distinguishing friend from foe and accordingly that they were naturally selected or in the familiar teleological idiom of neo-Darwinism that they were designed by the quasi-agent natural selection to provide such solutions. These specialized functionally discrete mental mechanisms or as they are commonly called modules are also posited as being innate domain-specific, meaning activated only by certain types of problems, genetically determined, and somehow, though it's not yet exactly known how, neurophysiologically realized, or in the computer-derived idiom of much mainstream cognitive science as being coded in our genes and hardwired in the singular, presumptively universally shared brain. Boyer's book presents a picture of human cognition as largely a matter of the automatic workings of innate mental mechanisms. And the book promotes the description of such workings as a properly causal scientific theory of religion that trumps all other explanations. Indeed, for Boyer, it is precisely insofar as an explanation of some phenomenon, any phenomenon, is put in terms of, quote, underlying causal mechanisms that it counts as scientific. I'll turn in a moment to how these views operate in connection with specific aspects of religion, but in relation to these central features of Boyer's account, two important preliminary points should be made. First, neither the computational modular model of mind 
nor the related idea of innate automatically triggered inference systems is a foregone conclusion of contemporary cognitive science or of any other science. Important alternative models of human cognition, both its operation and its evolution, have been developed both in cognitive science as such and in such related fields as developmental psychology, neuroscience, philosophy of mind, and paleoanthropology. These models give due attention to the significance of ongoing individual experiential learning, the social transmission of skills and beliefs, and the presence among post-Paleolithic humans of such cognitive resources as language, schools, recording instruments, and texts. Such alternative accounts also give due attention to significant non-invidious differences among individuals and groups with regard to aspects of cognitive processing. In other words, and contrary to the assumptions of paradigmatic evolutionary psychology, it's by no means clear that all humans in every culture from prehistoric times to the present share a uniform mind, or that our interactions with our environments are determined largely by the operation of mental mechanisms hardwired at birth. What Boyer presents in Religion Explained as a properly corrective, hard-nosed, hard scientific explanation of religion to court based on up-to-date established evolutionary cognitive knowledge is, in fact, a more or less speculative account of selected features of religious belief and practice based on a set of still controversial theories developed in fields at some distance from both biology and neuroscience. Secondly, this is of the preliminary points, Boyer's identification of scientific explanation with descriptions of underlying causal mechanisms is questionable both from a theoretical perspective and also in relation to what can be claimed by his own accounts. While the identification itself reflects classic views formed when the major examples of scientific explanation were drawn from the physical sciences, current understandings recognize a variety of causal and explanatory modes and due attention is given to the biological, behavioral, and social sciences, where causal explanation often takes the form of models of the emergence of phenomena from the dynamic interaction of multiple forces and contingent events. With regard to many aspects of religion, the latter sorts of explanation are likely to be more adequate to the range of phenomena involved and otherwise more illuminating than the unilinear, unidirectional, inside to outside, depth to surface models sought and produced in evolutionary psychology. Indeed, on Boyer's own definitions, the accounts he offers of various aspects of religion are scientific primarily in aspiration. Thus, while he distinguishes scientific explanations as those, quote, expressed in terms of observable physical mechanisms or those that describe observable phenomena and explain them in terms of other phenomena that are also detectable, in many of his own explanations, as in those of evolutionary psychology more generally, physical often means mental, observable often means inferred, and detectable often means strenuously posited and confidently asserted. I'll turn now to some of those specific explanations. For Boyer, as for new naturalists generally, the positing of supernatural beings or the existence of supernatural concepts is seen as a defining feature of religion. The soundness of that view, including the presumed transparency and transhistorical stability of the meaning of supernatural itself, will concern me in subsequent lectures. But today I want to look more closely at how Boyer explains the origin of such beings and concepts. In his account, now pretty standard among new naturalists, two mental mechanisms are said to be central. One is a system for agent detection, said to have evolved to alert our ancestors to the possible presence of predators, and even now hair-triggered by unexpected appearances. 
The idea is that due to the hypersensitivity of this mechanism, humans are led to posit agents even when none are there. For example, when confronted by sudden striking and otherwise inexplicable events. The second mechanism involved in the origin of supernatural concepts is the automatic activation of an inference system related to categories. In the modular view of cognition that Boyer follows here, the concepts we can form are limited by a set of basic hardwired ontological categories, for example, animal, plant, person, or tool, each of which has a set of default properties. Thus, once the activation of our agent detection module has caused us to posit an agent and on some basis to classify it as a person, the mind automatically fills it out with such default properties as vision, intentions, moods, and memories. In this way, we or our minds generate watchful ancestors, angry spirits, and jealous gods who, like other agents we classify as persons, we automatically assume may have friendly or hostile intentions toward us and whom, as other social interaction inference systems kick in, we also automatically assume must be thanked, flattered, feared, and appeased. Now, a certain amount of this makes sense and indeed has done so for centuries with the cognitive tendencies here computerized by Boyer, recognizable under such terms as animism, anthropomorphism, personification, projection, or indeed the pathetic fallacy, all traditionally seen as in some way natural and primitive features of human psychology. Thus Hume, in a passage cited by several new naturalists and sounding in some respects very much like one of their company writes as follows, this is a nice long quotation from Hume. Quote, there is a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted and of which they are immediately conscious. We find faces in the moon, armies in the clouds, and by a natural propensity, if not corrected by experience and reflection, ascribe malice or goodwill to everything that hurts or pleases us. Trees, mountains, and streams are personified, and the inanimate parts of nature acquire sentiment and passion." End quote. A related observation, but a more epistemologically radical one, occurs in the genealogy of morals, where Nietzsche describes our tendency to posit discrete unilinear causes and effects, along with personalized doers and purposeful deeds in the face of natural phenomena that could otherwise be perceived as processes of unfolding, behaving, or becoming. Nietzsche notes pointedly that this double tendency is found even among scientists as illustrated by their positing of various forces said to move or to cause this or that. Thereby, he suggests reifying processes and projecting intentional agency onto naturally occurring phenomena. Boyer would insist that there's an important difference between observations such as Hume's or Nietzsche's, which merely describes certain human tendencies, and his own genuinely scientific explanations, which identify the mechal, sorry, mental mechanisms that cause them. There certainly are significant differences. In Hume's account, personification reflects not the automatic activation of an innate hardwired inference system, but a tendency to project onto other beings what we observe and experience as our own features and feelings, while Nietzsche suggests that the very ascription of perceived effects to hidden causes, as in Boyer's own ascriptions of human behavior to interior mental mechanisms, reflects a tendency of what Nietzsche calls the popular mind. Boyer's explanations here do represent intellectual developments in some respects. But one would hesitate to say, I think, that they amount to a quantum jump from the merely commonsensical 
to the certifiably natural scientific. Similar considerations are evoked by Boyer's account of the connection between religion and death. Contrary, he argues, to the emotive theory of religion, supernatural concepts such as immortal spirits or an afterlife do not arise either from an abstract metaphysical dread of mortality or from people's need for consolation at the death of loved ones. They arise, rather, from a set of intuitive responses and innate impulses elicited by the presence of a dead body. Specifically, fear, because for our Stone Age ancestors, a corpse was a sign of predators nearby. Avoidance, which evolved to protect us from pollution from such bodies. And grief, triggered by the confusion or frustration of our hardwired systems for social interaction with recognized persons. These automatic responses are attached to already existing similarly triggered concepts of the supernatural, for example, immortal gods living in invisible places, to yield such familiar religious ideas as undying human spirits or a human afterlife. Again, and despite the dubious and somewhat dispiriting insisting, insistence on automaticity, many elements of this account are both plausible and illuminating, especially when enriched with ethnographic data as they are in Boyer's book. Two important points, however, must be added. One is that nothing in this account negates or trumps the more familiar suggestions concerning dread and consolation. Boyer's account simply adds another set of suggestions to them at another level of explanation. The second point is that the least persuasive elements in Boyer's account, at least as I uh, see them, are those that are most directly derived from the computational modular view of cognition as formulated in evolutionary psychology. That is the suggestion that all our reactions to death and dead bodies are innate, genetically specified, and hardwired, and the assumption that all the mechanisms involved are discrete, domain-specific, and provoked directly by external inputs. Boyer's commitment to these ideas is also responsible for his failure to remark, much less explain, the historical record of the range of culturally and individually differentiated responses to death, or the variety of known cultural elaborations of concepts of souls, spirits, and the afterlife, or the modes of experiential acquisition and social transmission conceivably involved in the generation, extension, and perpetuation of these concepts and related practices. These aspects of religion and of human behavior and culture more generally, the historical, the differentiated, the experientially acquired, the culturally elaborated, and the socially transmitted, are not merely overlooked or downplayed by Boyer and other new naturalists. They are determinedly excised by the conceptual, methodological, and ideological commitments that currently define their approach. The limits of Boyer's repertoire of explanatory mechanisms become especially evident in his treatment of religious rituals. Like many other new naturalists, he not only valorizes explanation over interpretation, but identifies interpretation with approaches that are cast as science aversive and intellectually barren. Uh, thus the dig at thick uh, description. Thus it's not surprising that terms like symbol or represent do not appear in his discussion of ritual or that he treats the idea of meaning so dismissibly there. According to Boyer, rituals, contrary to the interpretations of most anthropologists and the accounts given by participants, are virtually meaningless. I have a long quote from Boyer now, quote, we often say that ceremonies are meaningful to the people who perform them. This may well be what some ritual participants themselves offer as justification for their performance, but do rituals really convey much meaning? What is the information transmitted? 
Not much, apparently. Most ritual language is either archaic, so no one has a clear idea of what it means, or formulaic, so you are mandated to repeat the same words as in previous performances. True, you can associate various ideas with what is being done, but this is mostly a matter of free associations, and the associations are certainly not explanations of the action." End quote. But this seems singularly obtuse. There are, of course, many senses of the term meaning, but clearly the ones relevant to rituals that is intended and understood by scholars and participants are those related to expressive activities, not those concerned with supplying new information. Thus, to speak of the meaning of an initiation ceremony, a burial rite, or a temple service is to speak of the ideas, emotions, connections, and reflections that its performance characteristically and more or less reliably evokes in participants, a matter not of free associations then, but of more or less specific effects and responses. Moreover, it is certainly in part because of the ideas, emotions, connections, and reflections that such rituals characteristically and more or less reliably evoke that they are valued by humans and come to be established by and among them. Or to put this another way, among the explanatory causes of communal rituals, what shape, establish, and perpetuate them are their effects as experienced by the humans who participate in them. Such effects, which participants, theologians, and anthropologists may speak of as a ritual's meaning, cannot then be excluded from its causal explanation. Significantly, it's the feedback loop here, the way socio-cultural institutions such as rituals are shaped and sustained by their own experienced effects that escapes Boyer's notice and is in fact excluded by the strictly linear unidirectional input-output model of human cognition that is basic to his causal theorizing. Let us recall, in communal rituals, Members of an otherwise dispersed group convene in an orderly manner, move and speak in or sing in unison, wear special garments, occupy special places, and view or hand around objects said to represent or represent or incarnate general ideas or important inaugural events relating to the occasion. All this, each time, typically creates in participants particular effects. It heightens and organizes particular emotions, renews and enriches particular memories and weight of the occasion and creates feelings of connectedness both to past and future events and to other people, both present and absent. Most of this is familiar to us as participants in one or another secular ri ritual graduation ceremonies, Thanksgiving dinners, New Year's Eve parties, and so forth. And all of it is known in spades to scholars and theorists of religion and to other observers and analysts, ethnographers, archaeologists, classicists, historians, and so forth, who for the past century or two have documented, described, interpreted, and compared various communal rituals, ancient and modern, primitive and sophisticated, and sought in these ways to understand and explain them both specifically and generally. For Boyer, however, this way of talking about rituals is, as he writes, in italics, not the explanation, end quote. To find that, he insists, we must go down to what he calls in accord with his own two-story, upstairs, downstairs model of cognition, the mental basement where we discover, once again, pre-installed, pre-programmed mechanisms and mechanical outputs, hardwired inferential systems for the strategic management of social relations, precise but unconscious rational calculations of the risks and advantages of association, and intuitions about the universal syntactic rules governing supernatural agents and special actions. 
Boyer lays out this mental machinery in some detail and illustrates its operations with, as ever, a wide array of ethnographic materials, very vivid examples from here and there. Nevertheless, I think, it remains questionable whether his mental basement level causal explanation of ritual is more intellectually illuminating or empirically adequate, or for that matter, more scientific in any historically or conceptually responsible sense of the term than the range of accounts produced by the anthropologists, archeologists, classicists, historians, and other scholars and theorists of the subject I just mentioned. What Boyer has produced is an additional package of speculations at another level of description in terms of other conceptual frameworks in a different conceptual idiom. There are gains and losses here. What is gained is the possibility of relating various aspects of religious ritual to what is currently theorized along certain lines about human cognition and the evolution of human behavior more generally. What is lost, at least if Moyer's, Boyer's meta-theoretical claims are heeded, is the rest of the entire history of thought about the subject. Happily, we need not take the benefits on his terms. To conclude then, we may accept the idea that the existence, persistence, and many recurrent features of the beliefs and practices that Western scholars currently assemble under the term religion reflect the operation of evolved cognitive tendencies that emerge more or less reliably among humans. In accepting that idea, however, we need not accept the specific evolutionary scenarios or specific mental machinery currently posited in evolutionary psychology. Nor need we think that all of what is assembled under the term religion has thereby been explained or that it could be and eventually will be explained by improved models of such machinery or improved scenarios of that kind. Nor need we think that such explanations have an exclusive claim to scientific status or that scientificity is a sufficient dimension or should be the sole criterion for assessing the adequacy of an explanation of religion or of anything else. I'll end here today. Next time, return to Boyer and other naturalist accounts of religion. Thank you. I'd be most grateful if you would, ident would identify simply the field that you come from. Very often it just eliminates a lot of um, irrelevant notions of where you're coming from. Yes, in fact, we would uh, ask you not only to do that, but I think we need to ask you to come to the microphone. Is that correct? There are mics on both sides. Please come to the microphone, identify yourself, and uh, because I think we are recording. Um. Uh, one of, I think um, most of the criticism about Boyer was um, accurate, particularly with his, um, his discussion on that's, that's ritual in terms mm -hmm. of being sort of a byproduct of our general tendency to be obsessive compulsive about you know, various things and cleanliness, etc. Um, but I think that, um, I guess to frame it as a question, um, with the sort of constant criticism on your part of his reliance on this innateness idea, um, I think even in, in his text, Boyer cautions us not to use loose talk about innateness, and I think Atron is the one that sort of slips in his book and uses the term module, 
do you think this stems from a lack of consistency um, in the literature, both in philosophy and cognitive science, about what exactly a module is? Well, both terms, the, the term I, I, the term innate itself is, uh, you know, has been investigated for. Uh, innate suffers from the fact that it's a historical term. So there are all kinds of historical notions of what it might mean with um, biological assumptions built into those ways of uh, understanding it that we would no longer accept. Module has a different kind of problem, which is that it's a new term, or it's, it's uh, here, and it, come, it is being developed in, in a number of different places with different definitions. So, I mean, you would get a definition in uh, Cosmides and Tubi that would be quite different from a definition in Photo. Uh, <coughs> so I think that it's a combination of, yes, uh, nobody's totally <laughs> consistent, and many, both uh, Boyer and uh, Atron um, and others uh, very often pull themselves up short and say, you know, but now we better be careful or what we have been using the word innate or the concept of mind and we need to define it. So you do find uh, that there are passages uh, and sections of their work um, that are much more careful. Um, uh, I think that the account of it that I gave um, does that is that particular mm, lineup of innate, domain-specific, uh, evolved, uh, Stone Age, all of that does tend to be laid out as uh, um, what the new cognitive uh, evolutionary approach amounts to. It bodes well for, uh, for the rest of the presentations. Uh, John Grimm, historian of religion. I work with uh, Native peoples, specifically Crow peoples in Montana. Uh, my question is, um, I was intrigued that you didn't uh, present one of the uh, uh, heretical positions that the Boyer might uh, charge with heresy, namely Dawkins' meme. And uh, I have my own uh, sense of why Boyer might call him a heretic, but they seem to be uh, simpatico and yet quite different. Could you say a little bit? Right. Um, I, I will be talking uh, about Dawkins a bit uh, in the third lecture when I uh, am reading uh, John Hort's Deeper Than Darwin, because uh, obviously uh, Hort is very exercised uh, by Dawkins, uh, and, and in ways, as I suggest, understandable understandably, even though I think he gets Dawkins wrong uh, sometimes, uh, means um, I simply haven't gotten to you know, that particular question of how um, uh, transmission occurs. My own feeling is that the idea of memes is, again, it's originally presented by Dawkins, uh, taken up by uh, others uh, and um, uh, Susan Blackmore and by Daniel Dennett given various elaborations. The most elaborate probably now uh, relevant to this in Dennett's book, uh, Breaking the Spell. Uh, so one part of the answer, why didn't I do it, is because I haven't gotten to it yet and I'll be talking about that set of ideas and the problems with them. Uh, and the other is that um, I really think it's a very limited idea and Atron, who I'll be talking about, you know, for about half of next lecture, um, uh, specifically rejects it. So it, it is not a central element of the new naturalist account if Atron can be considered a leading uh, figure, and I think he is uh, a leading figure now. So uh, it, it would be a very good topic to elaborate how it is that it got to have the centrality that it does, and also to talk in the same way as I have about uh, some of these other um, concepts, and that is, you know, to a certain extent, they'll explain something. Uh, in other ways, they seem uh, quite limited, and then one has to think about how they operate in the public imaginary, why it is that they themselves become uh, very significant uh, sort of attractors of, of attention. Uh, I, I hope that's enough of an answer, but it's a bit of a postponement. Um. Uh, I'm from computer science, so I'll let that rest. A question. Uh, I can't 
tend to agree with you that these uh, uh, cognitive scientific explanations of religion are premature, and some of these evolutionary biology explanations may always be pre premature. But uh, it seems to me that the computational uh, explanation or framework for explaining uh, the way the brain works could be correct and really not, and be completely independent of questions about religion. And that uh, it really, uh, and in particular, a lot of all these, these anthropological explanations and others could be correct. And that framework still be very illuminating and, and ultimately be the main way we understand the brain. I wonder if you could comment. Yes, no, no, I wouldn't disagree with that. In fact, um, new models come out all the time, certainly uh, coming out of um, computer metaphors, uh, notions of modularity, notions of computation. Um, are elaborated in ways that I don't always find in, uh, annoying and limiting in the ways that I've described Boyer. It's to the extent that it draws on what I described as the paradigm form, uh, form of it as it was developed in the early 90s by uh, John Tooby and Lita Cosmides in um, the field of evolutionary psychology in particular. So they took a certain notion of computation and is popularized, by the way, by Steven Pinker, who a, a number of people will have read probably more than uh, Cosmides and, and Tooby. Uh, so it's that particular way in which um, both the notion of computation operates and the way in which the mo modular is defined and particularly the way in which the brain is um, both invoked and at the same time always pushed aside. Because evolutionary psychology is not brain science. Uh, evolutionary psychology uh, uh, always makes a distinction between the uh, hardware and the software. And the claim is that they are interested in the programs, in the software. And the hardware they leave to uh, the neuroscientists, the brain scientists. I said sort of parenthetically as we went along, the presumption is that there is a n neural um, realization of the mechanisms, the systems, the modules that are talked about. But that is not the theorizing that occurs with regard to explanations of behavior does not itself, is not itself constrained by neurophysiological considerations. And so I think that that's uh, in itself a, a significant problem, and that is there's tremendous appeal to the idea of the brain. I have no quarrel whatsoever with the notion that there might be, and indeed are, uh, already in existence, important ways of illuminating certain kinds of cognitive processes by analogy or perhaps even instantiation in computational programs uh, of, of uh, brain function. Um, my, uh, but that is not what evolutionary psychology depends on. There is an appeal to it, but not an actual drawing in. And this very often conflict uh, and um, uh, worries for evolutionary psychology of developments that uh, occur in neuroscience. Um, I, I know this is a big question, but because can you, can you um, give us some kind of, for those of us who you know, aren't scientists and really haven't studied the breadth of science, even from the humanistic point of view, as you have, what counts for, for a scientific account of something? Um, well, that's what I... I, I I mean, the answer is that it varies. I gave Boyer's particular way of saying what makes something a scientific, and that rehearses what uh, Cosmides and Tooby would say. It's the identification of underlying causal mechanisms where the idea of underlying and causal mechanism is there is something machinery inside that responds to things that come in and produces behavior. So it's that particular way of understanding it so that religion gets explained. Yeah. Any, any aspect of it, at least that they undertake to explain, gets explained when you can identify that causal mechanism, when you can say, now again, because it is not 
brain science, the identification of a, um, of a mental mechanism is not, let us say, surgically, who knows what can be poked around. It's not identifying. It is an inference that is based on that whole chain of um, reasoning that is um, we familiar from evolutionary psychology and other kinds of adaptationist you know, sort of rapid adaptationist, um, uh, made popular in sociobiology. Some of it, as with all of these things, is better uh, than some others. But uh, what the notion that you're only scientific um, when you have been able to identify uh, a mechanism of that sort in as far as human behavior is concerned, and that everything else is non-scientific or pre-scientific is um, a particular um, way of defining being scientific that could be questioned. Um, there are philosophers, though people here who know something about the philosophy of science, that would be considered, I, I think, just uh, dated and, uh, and dubious. Um, I, I got that, that you feel like his claims that this is the scientific account of it is inadequate. but. You know, just to be clear. No, I think it's wrong. I yeah, mean, <laughs> it's wrong. I mean, you, there are things that are inadequate, but I think that the claim that this is the scientific is, uh, you know, is, is wrong as far as the current usage of the term and current understanding of what one, it's, you know, it's to say what makes an explanation scientific um, is, uh, takes some very, very careful kind of formulation. You can say scientific as opposed to humanistic, and I do, I will be doing some of that, uh -huh. making that kind of opposition. But if you want to follow it through as rigorously as possible, um, uh, conceptually and with keeping terms, you know, with some responsibility to their historical usage, that's, that's hard work to be able to say what it is. And I, I don't think that there can ever be a particular answer in the sense that um, some definitions are going to feel more responsible to current practice, others are going to feel more responsible to a history of usage in the philosophy of science. So we'll be able to get, I just want to you know, raise it because it, you're not at all saying that, and I, I know this for a fact, that um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't pay attention to attempts to scientifically uh, give accounts of religion. No, I, I, yeah. that and is so, certainly not. I, so that, will become, that will become clear. Ne uh, next lecture, basically, and in the, next, the following lectures, what I will say is that, in, with just this sense, I am sympathetic to the idea of naturalistic accounts of religion, but some of them are better than worse. Uh -huh. And uh, I wanted to particularly identify what I see are limits in those that are right now um, occupying a great deal of public attention and high visibility. So, and it's in a very important um, difference. So it's not to say it's wrong because it claims to be scientific or it's wrong because it's naturalistic. It's that it's limited and um, um, it does not do what it claims to do in, in the following respects. That's more or less the shape of my uh, um, argument. I'm a retired electrical engineer on pension from the old Bell Laboratories where I worked in computer science ah, mostly. Right, yeah. uh, so I, I originally I wanted to say something different, but I will. Uh, I like the Popper definition of a scientific statement as something that can be disproved. Mm -hmm. But of course, in historical sciences, as Gould said, right. that's a difficult kind of. But what, what I wanted to say is, I, I recently, I, I really enjoy reading Damasio on the mind. And uh, I wonder what, if you would say something about I, the, the idea of emotions and feelings being the basis of a lot of what goes on. Yes, uh, well, I'm happy to. By the way, just before I answer that, just very quickly, it was the definition of scientific explanation as distinct from other kinds of explanations, as, which is a different question from the definition of science as opposed to non-science. So there's a, 
uh, specificity there, which shouldn't be lost. Now, I'm, uh, when I gave an outline at the beginning of my own view of cognition, and I spoke of it as, you know, a notion of cognition as totally embodied, uh, uh, certainly uh, among my footnotes, uh, uh, Damasio uh, figures very significantly. Um, so it is that notion of um, to try to understand cognition not just as an operation that occurs between the ears, but as a, a name that we give to the interaction of the organism with its environment, which is ongoing, does not occur you know, in discrete units, and uh, involves many systems which cannot, where it is not particularly useful to distinguish inside and outside. Obviously, some things are further into what we call the center, and some things are closer to where the air hits the skin, um, but that that isn't the, uh, a significant uh, dimension of uh, what makes something an aspect of cognition or not. So that um, I, I, as far as Damasio's um, emphasis on the way in which uh, uh, emotion is involved in mm, personality, decision making, um, uh, the whole operation, the con that emotion is continuously involved in, the, uh, in all of our operations is a very, very, I think, important contribution. And I admire very much his efforts to sort of put it all together uh, uh, at a descriptive level and also to put it into touch with um, a history of explanation of, of behavior. So that's what I would say. as a developmental trajectory. So innate, as you suggested in the discussion, is a very slippery word. Uh, genes don't do anything without environments in which they interact. And as uh, for Professor Martin's question, uh, I think that there are two dimensions to explanation that sort of working at play here. I think what Damasio, uh, or sorry, what um, Boyer is like, develop, uh, like uh, evolutionary psychologists is doing is trying to pose the question of why certain observable phenomena exist. And that is a historical question. And therefore, it, practically everything that is said is in the realm of hypothesis. Uh, because the brain is the organ that generates behavior and religion is a form of behavior, that leads Boyer into talking about the brain. And un unfortunately, I agree with you, he, um, he could use other language, but the language of module, in my view, is just metaphor at this juncture for, uh, in terms of cognitive processes. And it can itself be as confusing as innate. Uh, I had one other thought. It's escaped me. We'll have to pursue it. I private. look forward to that. Thanks very much for your comments. Yeah. Hi, I'm a student in New Testament. I just had a I wanted to ask a clarificatory question. Um, it, from what you described of Boyer, it seems like he'd be susceptible to some earlier philosophical critiques of psychologism. And I wondered, does he deal with that either explicitly or implicitly? So would you repeat it, please? Uh, it seems like Boyer would be sort of sus susceptible to some earlier philosophical critiques of psychologism, say by Husserl. Oh, psychologism, yeah. Um, part of um, what's interesting here is the way in which um, and I will talk about that next lecture uh, in connection with Boyer and Atron, and that is their rejection of phenomenological description, of description from the perspective um, of the uh, participant or the subject, uh, does rehearse uh, important controversies in the history, precisely in the history of the formation of psychology as a discipline and in the, his, uh, in the history of the formation of religious studies as a discipline. So. Uh, 
um, Boyer is not a good historian. Uh, that puts it mildly. And there is a great deal of the sort of very uh, glib, made up, uh, disciplinary history um, that um, he uh, flashes. Uh, same thing done by Cosmides and Tooby. Same thing done, I'm sorry to say, by E.O. Wilson, very objectionably. Same thing done by Pinker. Same thing done by Dennett. Dennett's particular version I'm going to talk about in the fourth lecture. But uh, you're absolutely right that so many, he doesn't engage it in terms of what the history of the issue was. No, no, this distinction that he makes between there's the scientific and there's the commonsensical is per absolutely absurd and highly objectionable. And also to say that each one of these, uh, all previous uh, theories have tried to explain religion by a single factor is, is again perfectly absurd when you think about works like Weber, uh, Sociology of Religion, uh, which is pretty multifactorial, to put it mildly, yeah.